Heads up, this episode contains some adult language, so if there are kids around, headphones or earmuffs should be considered. Hello, hello, and welcome back to Good Matters, a show all about creating good in the world through business. I'm Rachel Parker Chavez, and if I'm ever even a fraction as cool as the person we have on today, I'll be so stoked. I'm sitting down with someone who, if she wasn't so down to earth, she'd be a little intimidating. She was raised as a classical violinist since early childhood, then graduated from an Ivy League school at age 21, after which she moved to LA and for the past decade has been touring with a well-known indie rock band, as well as doing other collaborations with noteworthy musicians and people. She's a singer-songwriter and most recently a founder of a music festival and community dedicated to empowering women. Anna Bulbrook, founder of Girl School. Girl School is a music festival with a mission to celebrate, connect, and lift women-identified artists, leaders, and voices. It's a movement and celebration of females challenging the status quo. Anna started Girl School in response to how few women she saw on stage in the alternative rock world, and it's grown into a vibrant network of women in music, creating an empowering community for one another while supporting women and girls. Anna, I'm seriously so excited to have you on talk about your super cool life and everything. So no, we can talk about my cat. So we can talk about your cat and <laughs> making t-shirts on it. No, honestly, like, I am, yeah, I've been really looking forward to just getting to catch up, but also getting to spend some time talking about everything you've built. Because as much as sometimes you have that feeling of, like, what is happening, you have built something really, really cool and amazing. Thank you. Yeah. So you're so welcome. Thank you for being here. Um, can you tell us a little bit just for purpose of backstory, um, a little bit about girl school and also kind of your background and how you got here. Yes. I was a classically trained violinist as a kid, grew up, like went to college, studied really seriously through college. And when I graduated, I realized I did not want to play in an orchestra. I realized that it's a very prescribed path. It's kind of like being a doctor where you, you get on this train and that's the train you ride and it's mm -hmm. very clear. And I just was allergic, instinctively allergic to that. So. I quit playing violin when I graduated from college. I moved to California from New York um, and I completely started over. Basically was like that classical violinist person is dead and like mm -hmm. I don't know, I don't know what is gonna happen now, but I need a job. So, <laughs> so I worked for a little while. I worked at a talent agency in classical music. I worked at a PR firm um, for nonprofits and like conductors and soloists and museums and stuff like that. Um, and in that time, I connected with this guy who I'd met at my first internship in LA um, when I discovered indie rock and kind of was becoming this new person and kind of trying all kinds of things. Um, and he was like, don't you play the violin? I've started this <laughs> band and I was like, ugh, if I had a nickel for every dude in LA who wants me to play violin in his like crappy indie rock band, I would be rich. And then I went and listened to his music on MySpace, mm -hmm. RIP MySpace. <laughs> And the demos were so good. Mm. And I was like, I'm gonna be in this band. I kinda at the same time, I got this job, this little gig, it was very short, um, in Aspen, Colorado, playing behind this rapper named Kanye West. And so I went and like stood behind him and I hadn't played violin in forever and was like, oh, wait a second, whoa, you can play violin like this? Like, this mm -hmm. is just, it's such a basic revelation, but I was so stuck in my classicism that I hadn't quite, like in classical music, it's not cool to collaborate with like pop artists or um, work in this more pop idiom. It's just, it's not really respected. And I think if you're a really intensely classical, classically trained player, it's really hard to break out of that and be mm -hmm. open to what is valuable or, um, good in other kinds of music. And I think I just, after I had that break and that time off, it recalibrated me and then I had this like complete mind opening revelation behind Kanye West. Uh, and then I joined the band like three days later. I think that Mikel and I got together and started playing music, the singer of Airborne. Um, you know, like I got back on Sunday and we got together on like Tuesday and then I was like, I'm gonna be in this band if it kills me. Um, and so then for 10 years I was, been playing in the Airborne Toxic event. It's like an alternative rock band. We toured the world, signed various major labels. I have a gold record, it's in the law over there. <laughs> um, played all the late night TV shows. Like, we did everything. We were on an episode of Gossip Girl, which was really crazy. Uh, 
And then at the same time, so when I joined Airborne at the same time, <laughs> I was working 60 hours a week and recording with this other band called Edward Sharp and the Magnetic Zeros. So I ha had this like really amazing, really hard, yeah. insane okay. year when I was 23, just doing everything. I don't think I slept. I don't think I was very healthy, but like, yeah. Like it was nuts. And that set like truly set me up for the next 10 years where I would tour with Airborne. And then when I could, I would meet up with Edward Sharp and just show up for the highlights. It was like, kind of amazing. <laughs> um, and then, you know, since then I've gotten to record and play with a bunch of different people. And so that was been, that's been the bulk of my life as being yeah. one of the five people in the Airborne Toxic event. And I sort of um, realized as I got to the end of this, or like just as the years went on at the beginning of being in a band, you're so wrapped up in the drama of making it and I just wanted to be like one of the gang. Mm -hmm. You just don't really notice or address, hey, I'm the only woman around most of the time. And we always had another woman on the bus with us, but like our opening bands would always be all boys. You know, I think we had one band with a woman singer open for us the entire, like on actual tour, the entire, 11 years, that, wow. you know, I mean, it was just, yeah. uh, so I think over time I started to realize I'm alone all the time. Where are the other women? You know, hey, I'm at another alternative rock festival. It's a radio festival. Like, where's where's another side woman? Mm -hmm. Like, is that, a th you know, and, and I can tell you who, like I can count on one hand who the usual suspects are, who are the other women I would see who are in bands at these festivals but you go to radio stations and there are more women in other parts of the music industry, but when it comes to people who actually play in bands and the people making decisions at radio stations and the people who are the highest echelons of labels and making spending decisions on mm -hmm. who markets bands, who signs bands, like it's a lot of men, right. it's a lot of white men. Right. And you know, that's nothing, nothing bad about white men, but it's just a lot of one group of people. And uh, I think, I just kind of really started to miss the company of women once I realized um, what it was like because I just hadn't had it. It's, it's kind of like uh, like if you get really hungry and you don't realize it, but you get really grumpy and you don't know why, and then suddenly <laughs> someone offers you like the most incredible, for me it would be like a plate of salad and a bar of chocolate, you know? <laughs> and I'd sit there and be like, oh my God, I'm so hungry. Yeah. I can't believe I haven't had this. And I had this like crazy mind bending experience where I volunteered at this all women, all girl rock camp, working with campers and being this all women utopia around music making and social justice. And music is the foil for teaching girls to take up space or you know, be loud or use your voice or be your most authentic self or like yeah. be a friend or you know, learn about body positivity or whatever. Um, and the first time I entered that environment, I think I like cried the entire time because I just had never had this experience. Like I hadn't, and I've been a professional mu musician touring around for like a decade. It was just like, holy shit, like this, this is here and you can have this. And like, now I want this all the time, but also mm -hmm. why isn't that reflected in sort of my real life, right. this real world, like right. this utopic experience that doesn't. So that rewired my brain. And then, you know, one thing led to another um, I was releasing some music and started this residency and I was like, let's just give it a theme. Let's make it women fronted. Let's call it girl school. And it was this free little local thing and it went really well. And then we got this crazy LA times feature, which to me was like so out of proportion with what we were doing, but showed me that like the outside community also really wanted to see women shine and was really ready for this kind of moment. And then internally during this residency, it just took on this really like deep personal meaning for me just to have other incredibly talented women around. We all kind of felt it and connected mm -hmm. around it and we're like, oh my God, you know? So my fear in starting that was that we'd be sort of like ghettoized and this like, hey, it's just this girl themed, you know, sort mm -hmm. of, like theme thing and it's gonna be like Lilith Fair and like, and instead it was this really beautiful, really impactful thing. So then of course I was like, well, now I have to do a festival. Yeah, <laughs> of course. <laughs> because like one night isn't gonna be enough. It needs to have critical mass. It needs to be yeah. like big and we need together to like create momentum and create this like force around this. Cause I was like, 
I'm here in my local East Side LA music community. You know, all the artists I know I can get to play are gonna be on the smaller side. Like, if, But if there's enough of us, we will have a voice together. And then mm -hmm. we did a festival and that, you know, went really great and really, again, meant a lot for all of us who were involved. And then it's sort of just unfolded from there. So now we've done two annual festivals in LA. We took it and did a little capsule festival with Tom Shoes at South by Southwest, mm -hmm. like this past March. And then we're gearing up for next year's festivals in LA and possibly beyond. <laughs> um, dreaming big. Um, yeah, so that's where I'm at. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, that's. It's been a big change. Yeah. And it's so awesome to hear kind of the, the revelation. Um, that you had when you were like, oh, I love the analogy of like, I'm hungry, but I don't realize I'm hungry. And then when I see it, I'm like, oh, like this is what I've been missing. Um, can you talk a little bit more about like the importance of that? In my life, I've had a couple of huge revelations that were very simple, but very earth shattering. And I kind of feel like if, if our perspective is has this boundary, like a horizon line around us, something happens, you have an incident and then it shifts your horizon line out a little further and then you can see all this new stuff you couldn't see before. And I think for me, just seeing women together making music in this positive and mutually impactful way shifted my horizon line to see, okay, I live in this all male world or mostly male world, mm -hmm. but if I go seek out other women, like I can, I can have this more. Right. And um, and hey, if together we can create a little bit more of a platform for everyone to stand on, and and shine from, then other women and other girls can see this and respond to it, and maybe have their horizon shifted outward and see, oh, well, if this person can do it, then I can do it too. And I think, like. Is it, I can't remember if it's Amy Poehler Smart Girls or the Gina Davis Institute or the both of them together, but they have this line saying, if she can see it, she can be it. Mm -hmm. But I think it's just true in life. Like if you can't see it, how can you aspire to it? I think it's hard to go in a direction if you don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to imagine something if you've never seen it. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And that actually, um, makes me think of something kind of an addition. So you have this amazing platform that you've created and it allows women to be uh, fronting bands and also producing the, the show and kind of all the major roles that would typically be a male dominated space um, filled by women. But then in addition to that, you also have a nonprofit partnership. And I think that speaks a lot to this kind of young, you said girls and this, the younger generation that you're giving that, that vision that you're talking about too. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, so, I mean, obviously, Girls School is a business. We are trying to yep. make money, mm -hmm. um, but we're also trying to create sort of a system by which you can make money, but also do something good. And um, I think sort of on the surface side, or like sort of if the business is here, <laughs> we're trying to employ women, um, give women opportunities to say production design a whole festival that maybe they wouldn't get out, you know, in just the in the typical festival yeah. world. Yeah. Um, and then also um, we want everyone who comes to the festival to be involved in giving back to girls in some way. So mm -hmm. we pick different nonprofit partners that are local to each festival. Um, and we give 100% of the net proceeds <laughs> from ticket sales. Uh, to support people who are actually doing the boots on the ground work of working with girls in some impactful way. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't always have to be music related. Okay. It just needs to impact girls. Yeah. Starting with the festival model, like that's sort of our biggest event and our calling card for what we do, but we do other events. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the festival isn't just a music festival. It also talks and panels and workshops from everything from having one of the best Ableton controllerists in the world speak about how to use the software last year and answer questions, like very specific nerdy technical questions, um, to having a group of, of women identifying people speak about what it's like to be in the queer trans space, to having a group of women speak about what it's like to sing or just work between different cultures, especially like bilingual artists and the, mm. how that impacts bilingual artists and also political artists. What does it mean to be 
singing in Spanish but in an English language market? What does it mean to be singing in Spanish in Canada but also be an like an indigenous person and mm. you know mm -hmm. <laughs> and like addressing some of those topics or yeah. what does it mean? Like we had Madame Gandhi speak and she did a workshop on like owning your voice. Mm. And what does that mean for you and how are you gonna apply that for yourself? And mm -hmm. it's not like confined to the music industry. It's like right. really for everybody and it's welcoming for everybody. Like it's not, the events are not just for women and if you come, you will see yeah. that. Really, really, this is fantastic. Um, so I wanna kind of break down a little bit for the purpose of people watching who are kind of thinking about not necessarily this specific career path, but career paths that have more of a purpose than to make money. I mean, like you said, the goal, obviously you need to make money. And I, that's what one of the things I love about social entrepreneurship is that you have a goal of making something better and making a change and making a difference, mm -hmm. but it's grounded in the stability and the sustainability of also having a revenue source and a revenue stream and a profit. I feel like it's important to make money. It's important to choose a business that can make money. Why don't we do that and also have an impact? Right. You know, it doesn't have to be preserving ancient music or educating people about the role of women since the dawn of time and yeah. how we've been overlooked. Like it can also just be today hiring women and giving women an opportunity and connecting women with like more mainstream opportunities so that at the end of the day, Coachella and FYF and other festivals are 50-50 and girls can just be a really cool festival that you want to go to because we program cool stuff. You know, like that's my goal. <laughs> yes. No, 100%. <laughs> now that you've done it, what would be your advice for someone who says, okay, I see an issue. I want to see something. I want to help it change. What would be your advice to those people? Like this is all unfolded so naturally. It's not like sure. I sat down and wrote my business plan and then like pitched <laughs> some people on it. It's like, you know, I've just been going and just mm -hmm. doing what felt like the right thing to do and then learning as I go. And then every time it grows a level, I need to learn more and it gets a little bit more official or more, you know, system systematic and yeah. all that stuff. Um, and you obviously know, cause that's how I met you. But um, I would say just start because I mean, unless you need $5 million to start, I think, um, a lot of really powerful things start small and get bigger. And I think one person raising their voice or starting to organize something can have a huge impact in 10 years and ripple outwards in all these different cool ways. And so, I mean, if I have taken anything away the last couple of years, it's that doing as opposed to not doing is a really powerful philosophy and will get you a lot farther than wishing or wanting. And I think it's really scary to it's really scary to take a stand, regardless of whether that's taking a social stand or political stand, or take a stand with yourself saying, I'm gonna do this and I want something. Like we were talking earlier about off camera about how it's kind of painful or like uncomfortable to want sometimes. It's hard to want because it's scary. It's scary to want something and not know how you're gonna get it, how you're gonna go about it. Like if people are gonna take you seriously while you do it, um, if it's gonna work. But first you have to want it and then you have to actually do something. And then you'll find out as you test the boundaries of how far you can take it. Like, like what were some of the first steps that you took when you were going from idea to execution of making this a thing that was more than a project? Um, what were some of the first good first steps? Um, ooh, I think having the idea and talking to people about it, like <laughs> I do a lot of talking and sort of thinking out loud and almost like selling the idea to people to see if I'm crazy <laughs> before I act just in general in life. That's just me as a person. So I'll like talk about something for a while before I do it. And I think in the act of saying it, you set the stage for making it happen. So you have to think it, you have to say it, and then you have to like start taking action. Also, when you say what you're doing to other people, then it gives people the chance to get on board or help you or think about someone who might want to get on board. I mean, there's a lot to be said for protecting your business plan and strategy, but I think there's a, also a lot to be said for sharing what you're doing with like-minded people or sometimes help comes from the randomest places. So I do a lot of talking. Mm -hmm. I think, um, gosh, what you said about people wanting to protect 
their idea. I think that happens a lot more than it should. So what you're saying is such good advice in terms of. Because you're worried someone's gonna steal it sure. or someone's gonna tell you it's stupid, which you you hope if someone thinks it's stupid, they tell you so that right. you can address what is weak about it or decide if you think maybe that person is actually stupid instead. Right, <laughs> right. But it's a good balance. Like if you yeah. don't tell anyone about it and you just build it secretly by yourself and then you b launch it to a bunch of people who might not care, you won't know that until it's there. What you're saying of going out and talking to people about it, either you'll get a lot of feedback that helps you to shift or you'll get help or you'll get any of this. I think there's a lot more benefit to sharing than the risk that comes with. And I think having not. people on board with you, whether or not they're actively participating, is really great for accountability. Mm -hmm. And like when we were starting the residency, I was like, guys, I just came from rock camp. I had this medical experience. Here's the deal. We can't find enough amazing bands who have the right quality. Then we'll abandon ship on this idea. We'll give it two weeks and we'll do our homework. And if we need to open it up, we will, because I'm not going to compromise on quality. And at the end of two weeks, we had this incredible list of bands. We had more bands than I could have ever programmed in the residency. Like, it was insane. I did, learned about all these new projects. Just the intention of I'm gonna just see and reach out and just start to look and ask friends. I yeah. mean, it's like, it was nuts. And then, is there any advice for people who are thinking about kind of going down this path of entrepreneurship specifically in the social, like in integrating a social piece into that that you have? I think if you're gonna integrate a social piece into entrepreneurship, it's one thing to start a music festival, but the second you say it has any kind of social mission, you actually need to know what you're talking about. And so I think I had a pretty steep learning curve where we programmed the first festival. First we did the little residency and it was fine, it was East Side Bands. You know, I wasn't taking that big a stand and I was just happy that we didn't get pilloried and compared to Little Fair. That's like literally it. Second time the festival happened and we kind of like dared ourselves to do this crazy thing and we programmed it and then looked around and we're like, man, it's kind of pale. It's kind of pale, it's kind of like starting from the east side musicians of Los Angeles who are in the indie rock scene and kind of working outwards. Like it's sort of a self-selecting group of people and this is cool and all, but even before we held the festival year one, once we looked at the lineup, we were like, oh, we need to do better. And so I think if you're going to truly embrace a social mission, that is a commitment that you need to really genuinely make to improve yourself and understand what you're embarking on. Because like, no one gives a fuck about another white feminist music festival. It's like, no one cares, you know? Like it needs, if you're gonna, so for me it was like, just learning and growing and trying to do better and like mm -hmm. also genuinely um, looking at my community and who I keep around me and just being like, hey, this is cool. This is one community, but I actually like need to look into myself and, and grow too. And so that was both scary because it's scary to take on uh, stances that aren't what you come from, or and it's scary to step into a new space, and s scary to admit you don't know things, mm -hmm. but it's really important, and it's the only way you grow. And so I, I would actually argue that the business part is the easy part. Do something good, <laughs> like, and always try to make it better, but the hard part is if you take on a social mission, it needs to be real, and you need to do it right, and you need to do your homework, and you need to surround yourself with people who understand, and, can help and help you move in the right directions and you need to be open for criticism and feedback. Mm -hmm. And then you need to take that to heart genuinely and then you need to grow and you need to repeat, and repeat, and repeat. I also think that there's a difference between like, and I think this is again, the social entrepreneurship and social justice versus business kind of tension. Or in this case, like, I think a beautiful symbiosis. On the social justice side, we frame things as there's a need and I'm gonna fill it. And on the business side, you frame it as there's an opportunity and I'm gonna fucking take it. And I think, I think social entrepreneurship has to look at both there's a need and I'm gonna be responsible in how I fill it, but also I'm gonna go sell this as an opportunity. Mm -hmm. Because it, as a business, it's an opportunity. And then as a person who feels things like, wow, I woke up one day and realized women are second class citizens, um, then you know, it's a need that you're filling. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so I think 
I think being aware that there's two ways to frame it or multiple ways to frame something is really helpful as you think through who you're talking to in different situations mm -hmm. and how you position what you're doing or just articulate it more than position it, I guess. Yeah, that's so good. Okay, um, tell us what's coming up next for you and for Girl School. Like what's cool, what's new, what's coming up next? Um, so we just did an event with Red Bull Sound Select um, where we curated this really cool night for them um, in downtown LA and that was really fun and really special and magical. Um, we have a couple events coming up this winter leading up to our next festival next year, which we'll be announcing soon. And then we have some new things that we'll be announcing soon for next year, which I'm really excited about, but haven't been announced yet. Okay, so if we want to make sure we get those announcements. If you want to make sure that you know <laughs> what the chef is serving, yeah. please go to <laughs> www.girlschoolla.com okay. and sign up for our mailing list. And also follow us on socials at Girl School LA on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook and all the stuff. All the places. Yeah. At Girl School LA. At Girl School LA. Am I right? So cool. And not just because she's in the music scene and doing all these awesome things in front of people, because she's so down to earth and humble about what she's learning and how she's growing and everything she's doing. As always, if you have any questions, please feel free to send them my way. If you like this episode, especially if you know of other people who are also interested in using business for good, please share it with them. And don't miss a thing by signing up for Defining Good updates, tools, and free resources you can't get anywhere else on defininggood.com. Remember, as an entrepreneur, you have a unique voice and a distinct circle of influence. So you can choose to ignore it or you can use it to change the world. Thanks so much for watching and I hope to see you again soon. It makes the most. <laughs> the shady emoji. <laughs> Oh, it's international. You don't even need Tinder. You just go to the coffee The shop. center of the yes, world yes, is in Echo no, Park. Yes. Did you guys know? The crossroads of the world. We've heard.